a very good evening and good to see you all today. On behalf of the Southeast England and London branch of our institute, I would like to welcome you all to our today's event. Today we have with us Christopher Lloyd of Petromal, who will be discussing with us on the topic offshore wind, decommissioning and life cycles. A few words about the speaker. Christopher is an associate consultant and project manager at Petromal. He was formerly business development manager and strategic project manager with Reef Subsea, an offshore construction and survey company. He is an experienced IMRS chartered engineer and operations manager, having worked for the last 15 years in the North Sea and Norwegian continent shelf. During his time at Saipam, UK, he worked on one of the North Sea's first major decommissioning project for the Frick Field and MCF, MCP01 in 2007-2008, requiring the removal of four steel jacket structures and six topside platforms. He is currently consulting in the offshore energy space of which the decommissioning is a large part of his work. Let's welcome Christopher Lloyd to deliver the presentation. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Um, I was originally asked to make a presentation on wind farm decommissioning for a conference in London back in February uh, 2019. And it's not a topic that many people have talked about yet. Now, although this presentation uh, is going to focus on figures from the United Kingdom, if you're in the United States, or you're in Norway, or the Middle East, or anywhere that has a highly developed fossil fuel industry and is looking into wind, or is developing a wind industry, you'll find that the principles are very similar, uh, if not even more so exaggerated, depending on where you are in the world. So, the first part of this um, is that um, a study came out from Bayes, which is a um, business uh, energy industry in the UK, showing that with all the new wind farms being constructed in the UK, there would eventually be a cost to decommissioning them, just like oil and gas. And this cost would have to be paid for by the wind farm developers. So I did some work on this, and I looked at the Bayes report, and it showed that the current costs of decommissioning would be between 1.28 and 3.64 billion pounds. And this is quite a big number. And some people are quite worried about that number. So I opened my presentation back in February and I said, first of all, don't panic. It's not the end of the world. You're looking at uh, UK offshore wind decommissioning costs of 1.28 to 3.64 billion. The UK's oil and gas decommissioning costs are currently between 45 and 77 billion pounds, uh, with a P50 you know, somewhere in the middle of 58. So. If you think that you're in trouble and you're a wind developer, you don't have anything to worry about. There are people with much bigger issues to deal with than you. And this is a subject that involves a huge number of stakeholders. Whether it's oil and gas or it's wind, you have government, you've got various technical authorities, operators, contractors, individuals, and finally consumers. So, what lessons can we work? What lessons can we learn from the petroleum industry, and what makes offshore wind different? So, firstly, you need to start early because decommissioning will take longer than you think. And to illustrate this, I'm going to talk about one of the first projects I ever worked on as a, a mid to senior grade engineer 
involving the decommissioning of a field called FRIG and a platform called MCP01. Now the FRIG gas field uh, is a natural gas field and it sits on the boundary between the United Kingdom and Norway. And the field itself is named for the goddess Frigg. Frigg, of course, was the wife of Auntie Hopkins, and that means that Frigg was also the mother of Chris Hemsworth. Frigg was an offshore oil field about 80 miles from the shore, directly east of the Orkney Islands. And you can see it here uh, in the photo. There's three of the, the structures. The water depth here was around 100 meters. Average wind speeds in this area were um, often over 20 knots and over 35 knots was not uncommon. So harsh weather conditions in the middle of nowhere. And it consisted of these platforms, uh, a cluster of I think it was five or six, straddling the UK and Norwegian borders, as well as MCP01, which was a pipeline pressure boosting station about halfway down the line uh, going towards shore. Uh, and this is MCP01 when we arrived at it at the first uh, stages of the offshore removal. And when you look at that structure, it's not one single block, it's not even two or three. This is a structure that was made piecemeal. It was literally made from containers being welded together um, and very small units. I mean, the size of, size of bedrooms, some of them, which have been welded together over years. And when it was decommissioned, um, and you'll see that in a moment, uh, it looked quite different. Now, in terms of the frig history, um, it was first discovered in 1971 and you know, went operational in the mid 70s. And it worked for many, many years, and finally, uh, the decommissioning plans for it were approved in 2003, and actual production ceased in 2004. But it took until 2010 to actually do all of the removals and all of the lifts and to clean up the site. So you're looking at a good six or seven years of decommissioning to do that whole field. And um, this is a source for a lot of lessons learned in the industry. Uh, and one, was one of the biggest, the first big decommissioning jobs in the North Sea. It's hard to find good photographs of the frig field, but here you can see on the left, these are all the structures in the cluster. Uh, one, two, three, four, five. And there was a sixth one, uh, which was a wreck, not shown in the photo. And the digital picture on the right was how it ended up. And you can see that the concrete footings for two of the far structures and the, the concrete basin structure for the one in the foreground, they were left in place. And um, there is currently no viable technology to remove them. So they will stay there either until they crumble apart or until another method can be developed to remove them safely. The second thing is it's going to cost more than you think. Whatever that estimate is for decommissioning offshore windmills, it's going to be more than that. Surprise! Almost every new kind of engineering ends up costing more than everyone originally thought. The UK Oil and Gas Association first did a survey uh, back in 2006. And uh, actually, before we go on to that, these are the costs from Frigg. Um, when it was first given a green light in 2002, the original value um, you can see down at the bottom there was just over 300 million pounds in 2010 money. And by the time it was finished, it was over 450 million pounds into 2010 money. So that's accounting for inflation and everything like that. So you can see 
that cost overrun of you know 50 percent uh, pretty hefty. So the UK uh, Oil and Gas Association did a survey back in 2006 and came back with a cost estimate for decommissioning all of the UK uh, oil, and gas, oil and gas assets. And they predicted that by 2030 they would need to spend, or the industry as a whole would spend slightly less than 22 billion pounds. So this is aiming for 2030. Um, and this was, to, this was to deconstruct the structures which were there that day. And there has been some growth in the UK North Sea since then. Um, another, about 30 more structures went in. That's about a 10% increase in growth. So maybe that number would increase by 10% by the time you got to say 2030. But it did increase. It absolutely increased. Further uh, surveys which were done in 2009, 2010, 11 and 12 all increased that estimate by well over 10%. And by 2011 it was estimated that £30 billion would be needed to decommission by 2030. All of this, by the way, is in, um, I think it's in 2017 money, so it's all accounted for inflation. Um, now, if we, predict, if we track those predictions forwards and we go to today, and we haven't had many more structures in the UK since 2011, there's been a couple, we'd be looking at almost £40 billion by 2030. Now, the reason why the graph stops at 2011 is because the industry realised that it would take a lot longer to decommission. 2030 was just coming too quickly. So they started to look at 2040. So here we go. They started to look at what the cost would be by 2040. And 2014 estimates were 41 billion pounds. If we project that forwards to today, in the same amount of money, we are looking at slightly less than 50 billion pounds. And it turns out that um, the UK government agrees. Um, a study was done um, fairly recently um, by the Oil and Gas Authority, and their estimate for 2018 was 58 billion. Um, slightly less than the year before uh, of 60 billion. So, that's what the oil and gas industry is looking at. Uh, and that's where that number of 58 came from, from the first slide, that uh, P50 number. That's the P50, the 50% 50 probability. There's a lot of room for movement, both up and down, depending on how we do as an industry. And if you're wondering how far along we are, you can look at the green graph at the bottom, and that shows you the total spent on decommissioning per year. 0.5 billion was spent in 2013, up to 1.8 in 2017. And um, the numbers for 2018 are very slightly less, 1.7 billion. So that's what we're spending each year. And if we're going to get to 60 billion, we're going to need to keep spending in the oil and gas industry. So, um, what, can we, what can we learn from the way the oil and gas industry has done decommissioning? Well, we can learn that if you're looking at 1.28, 3.64 now, um, and the original estimates that the oil and gas industry came up with way, way back, some 14 years ago, uh, was 21.9, the number here is probably going to increase. It could be by a similar amount. We could be looking at you know, up to 15 billion or more. So just have that in your heads that we need to learn as much as we can about decommissioning in the next few years. Because really, relatively speaking, if anybody's been involved in any oil and gas projects recently, sorry, if anyone's been involved in any 
new wind farm activities recently, ask yourself, how much thought did you think about decommissioning them? Now, there is a requirement if you're doing a wind farm today, you have to write a decommissioning plan. And usually the decommissioning plan is about half a page that says, well, we put them in with a big crane, and we'll take them out with a big crane. And technically that part isn't difficult. But it does cost resources, and it does cost time, and it has to be borne in mind. So, we need to understand the supply chain behind this. Who is doing this work, and how? Now, this is uh, from the UK Continental Shelf, and this is looking at the expenditure on decommissioning in the last few years. Uh, and they're looking slightly ahead. And you can see that, historically, about 8% of all the money spent on decommissioning has been on project management. Um, a large chunk of it, almost 50%, is on plugging the oil and gas wells and making sure they're safe to leave behind. A large portion of that has been topside removal um, and uh, preparation, the making safe, flushing out the hydrocarbons and things like that. Um, the light blue section at the top is subsea and site remediation. So that's looking after the seabed, removing bits of pipeline, um, bits of electrical cable and things like that. And that tiny black sliver at the top is the recycling costs of the top sides and the substructures. So what could this look like for wind? Well, um, we're going we're gonna to take out the well abandonment bit, because that's not relevant. Um, and, you know, maybe uh, it might look something like this. Um, so, of the all remaining costs, 40% was topside and substructure, and another 30% was making safe. Now, I don't think this is what the wind farms are going to be looking like, because there's relatively little preparation that needs to be made to remove a window. And I think project management is a little bit over the top. So if we lock project management to 10%, which is about average for any capital project these days, making safe, that's going to go down. That's going to go much, much further down. The top side of removal costs includes vessel costs, which is important. Uh, that's, I think that will probably stay the same, and um, there will be some subsea work to remove cables and to remove the, the turbine bases and things like that. So if we do that, we are probably looking at something more like this. 50% of the costs are probably going to be related to moving the actual blades and the foundations. There will be some making safe, there will be some subsea remediation, but a large part of it, and we're going to explore this in a moment, is going to be the top side and blade recycling. And this is something that the oil and gas industry hasn't had to deal with. And I will explain why. One of the first things that we have to bear in mind is vessel utilisation. This is going to be the biggest contributing costs for removing the turbine blades. Okay? And in the UK, just like everywhere else in the world, we use Dracker Briggs like the one shown in the photo. And we hope to be using similar sort of technology in the future. But there is a demand for these vessels. Okay? We're building new wind farms every year. We're putting in more turbines every year. There are new companies building these vessels. But one of the problems that the oil and gas industry has come up against is that they are removing much, much bigger vessels, sorry, much, much bigger structures, and there aren't enough vessels to do it. 
we have what's called utilization numbers, where we look, and there are various companies that do this as a service, and they will look at a particular month, uh, and this was uh, January, how many drill ships are there in the North Sea? How many are being used, and how many are available? And you can see you've got the utilization there. And the same goes for jackups and semi-subs and so on. Now for wind, obviously the one we're concerned about is jackups. Uh, and in, in that particular month, in January, when the weather is terrible and nobody wants to install windmills, obviously the utilization is fairly low, it's 42%. But in the summer, when the weather is good and um, the seas are flat, these jackups all get used. So you can't just hire one whenever you like, there is a queue for them. And you can look at graphs like this and you can look at the high grade uh, jackups and say, wow, you know, sometimes they're at absolute peak, sometimes they're at 100%. Every single one in the North Sea is being used. What happens when something is in high demand and there isn't enough supply? The price goes up. So if you are thinking about decommissioning your wind farm in a particular year, and so is the wind farm that's down the coast, and you're both fighting for the same vessels, you're going to get into a bidding war. It's going to be who contracts furthest and who offers the biggest price. And that is something that will require a huge amount of planning and hopefully cooperation between <coughs> oil and gas companies now and wind farm operators in the future. And so this is the biggest component of your, your topside removal, is using these vessels, getting these turbines back to shore. The other thing is, as wind farms get bigger and wind turbines get bigger, we start using bigger vessels. This photograph here is the Cyprus 7000. This is a vessel that's been working in the oil and gas industry for decades. It's one of the most expensive and biggest ships in the world. Um, these are some of the biggest cranes in the world. Each crane can lift 7,000 tons. Uh, and it's not the biggest, there are bigger ships than this. Okay, Herima um, has a number of them. These are all um, big heavy lift ships uh, that can lift thousands of tons. Now the reason why we need a crane vessel this big isn't because the windmill weighs 7,000 tons, it's because it's so tall. And you need that size of vessel purely for the height. So, not only are wind farm operators going to be competing for um, jackups that work in the wind industry, they're going to be competing for jackups and semi-subs that work in the offshore oil and gas industry. So again, you're squeezing the supply chain and you're just going to make the price rise. The other big part of that graph that I showed you was um, removing and recycling the, or recycling and handling the blades. Okay? A big black triangle, big black quarter, I think is about 25%. Now, why is this so big compared to oil and gas? Well, let me show you MCP01 again uh, that I worked on. And when you look at that structure, all of the topside element, at least a good portion of it, is what? It's steel. And most of it is steel. There's a lot of other things in there. There's a lot of wiring and piping and insulation materials. But a lot of it is steel. And certainly the big jacket structures that you see, the big sort of scaffolding bits that go down to the seabed, are all just steel. Um, so this is us decommissioning um, MCP01. And you can see all of these small modules on top of this concrete frame. And we have to remove them bit by bit by bit. Okay? All of these containers we had to take over, these are filled with, with cutting gear and abrasion gear and, and welding 
equipment and, uh, and safety equipment because the structure was abandoned. And we're cutting these things off. And I have another picture here from one of the other platforms where we were literally, um, literally going in with JCBs and tearing down these steel structures and putting them into skips. Um, and they were never designed to be removed. Now, a lot of this material will have gone to landfill, but a lot of the steel would have been recycled. Steel is relatively easy to recycle. The current price of steel is about £100 per tonne. Uh, and that's if it's homogenous. If it's all you know, decent pipeline steel, it's about £100 per tonne. If it's cars, which are made of lots of different metals, you know, some steel with some aluminium and bits of plastic mixed in and things like that, it's half of that. But at least you can pour that scrap steel into a smelter um, and, a, and a steel plant and you can recycle it at least. Um, now if you've ever gone through the countryside, you've ever gone walking and you've seen something like this, okay, some old abandoned piece of farm machinery, um, you might be able to, to take all that again, it's mostly steel, throw it into um, a steel mill and it might be worth 50 pounds to somebody just in pure scrap weight. And maybe you could kibble down the, the tires or something, but, uh, but most of that you can get back. Turbine blades. What are turbine blades made of? I mean, the tower itself and the foundation will be steel. You can melt that down. What are these made of? GFE. GFE. Yeah. These are um, mostly um, carbon fiber, essentially. Yeah. Carbon fiber. And you can't really recycle carbon fiber. It's a composite material. It's, you know, it's glue and glass, and it's, carbon fiber is so good and so expensive is because it doesn't come apart. Um, now the new turbines that we're putting in, uh, I don't know if you saw, about four days ago, um, Scotland completed a huge new wind farm, fourth biggest in the world. Um, each one of the turbines, I think, is seven megawatts. And a seven megawatt turbine um, is producing, I think it's about 70 tons of blades when you decommission it. So three blades, 70 tons between them. So 70 tons of carbon fiber. There's not a lot you can do with that. I mean, there are some experimental processes. You can, um, you can heat it up to 500 degrees, and some of it will start to melt. But then you don't get much back. You can grind it up into a sort of a powder, and you can put it back into um, the chemical process, and you can make things like paint with it. Or you can use it as filler in concrete. But concrete's dirt cheap. Concrete's worth nothing. You're not going to get any value out of it, but you're going to have to handle them. I spoke to a, a recycling plant in Germany, a, a scrap plant basically, and they've been given some blades to deal with. They can't break them down fast enough. Now that's now, when they're hardly getting any. There is no facility in the UK or uh, in Europe or anywhere in the world that can break down the hundreds of blades which are going to come from decommissioning wind farms. Now, the petroleum industry has dealt with similar issues. There weren't, um, there weren't many docks in the UK or Norway that could take these structures. And the country is now investing in building um, bigger basins and bigger quaysides to be able to take these huge structures. Uh, and some of them have already spent a huge amount of money. So now, we need to be looking at what we can do in the wind industry to build up 
this kind of supply chain. We need to be looking at building an industry that can recycle blades for the future. So, if all of that's a little bit of doom and gloom, and you're getting fed up with me talking about the downsides and the increased costs of decommissioning offshore windmills, let's take a short diversion. Let's talk about ancient history and 1066. In 1066, um, the Norman French army of William, the Duke of Normandy, defeated the Anglo-Saxon King Harold at Hastings. William the Conqueror became King of England. And one of the first things he wanted to know was, how much land and stuff did I win in this fight? So, as a result, the Domesday Book was produced. This was a book that took 20 years to write and was the greatest and most detailed survey of the United Kingdom <coughs> for almost 800 years. And one of the things that was established in conjunction with the book was all of the recorded lands and assets within the United Kingdom. And as part of it, um, all of those lands, including all of the mineral rights to them, from then on, belonged to the king and to the king alone. Um, now, this is obviously very specific to the UK, but um, less than 100 years later, someone else had a, sl a very similar idea. This man, Emperor Barbarossa, that's Frederick I, uh, Holy Roman Emperor to you or me, he recorded something called Bergringel, um, writing down for the first time in Germany as part of the Constitution in 1158, effectively removing the mineral rights from the landowners, who from then on had to purchase all their mineral rights from the king. Now, later on, many of these mineral rights passed down to the, the territorial lords in Germany and the Holy Roman Empire. And in the UK, like in many other countries in the world, many pieces of land were given away by the monarch to various counts, barons, lords, and other individuals. And many of them are now privately owned. Um, some were returned, were retained by the king or queen. But the rights to silver and to gold and then later coal and oil and gas were retained um, by the king or queen. And today those assets are managed by the Crown Estate. And the Crown Estate also looks after the offshore resources. Um, depending on where you are in the world and which country you're in, there will probably be an agency similar to the Crown Estate looking after offshore resources in your country. In the United States, it's the Mineral Management Service, for example. And the reason I mention this is because, you know, this is where a lot of the, the laws for private mineral extraction came from originally and were uh, leveled out so they're all the same. And the principles were created. So when you build a wind farm, um, you're going to rent or lease that land from the Crown Estate for 25 years or whatever it might be. And if, you're, if you have an oil and gas license or you have a, if you're digging for coal or tin or whatever it might be, you have an agreement that you can take resources out of that land for that duration. And you might have to pay a fee um, to whoever that landowner is for the privilege of doing so or they might take a royalty, whatever. Um, and in the, in the current case, um, if you're going to build windmills, actually you, it goes either way. You ask for a slight incentive to build your windmill because the country needs energy. In the last couple of years, though, a number of operators have put proposals to their governments to say, we'd like to build a wind farm in a particular area 
And we don't need any subsidies now. The industry has advanced to a point where the technology is cheap enough and we can break even without needing top-up fees um, to sell the energy. So let's focus on growth. If you're building a wind farm and you've leased this land for 25 years, it's not like oil and gas or coal or tin. Because after 25 years, you still have the same resource in that bit of land, in the wind. It doesn't go away. After 25 years, you don't, you're not going to be handing the land back saying, well, say, we've run out of oil, here's your useless bit of land back. No, that bit of land still has wind. So, if we are doing some sort of capital asset project, um, all the engineers in the room will recognize cycles like this. You'll do some, some, some sort of concept design, you're going to do some sort of planning, you're going to launch it, you're going to do some sort of performance control and check that it's working as planned, and then you're going to close the project at the end. And if we're talking about capital assets, whether it's building power plants or building ships or um, building architectural buildings in London or wherever it might be, you have some sort of capital asset project process. You do a feasibility study, you do some design and development, you do feed, detailed engineering, you procure all the equipment you need, you build it, you commission it, you operate it, you maybe try to make it a little bit longer towards the end, but eventually you have to decommission it. That's normal in every capital asset industry. And then maybe you go on to do another one somewhere. You build another building, you build another power plant, you build another ship, whatever it is. And you go through that process each time. But if, you, if, you're, if your asset is going to be utilizing that same source of revenue, that same parcel of land offshore, with the same wind, and it may not be exactly the same because climates change, but we'd like to hope the wind still blows in 25 years' time at least. If you're doing that, then the process doesn't necessarily have to end. After 25 years, your turbines might be old and a bit rusty and not very efficient, but you still have the resource. So there's no reason why you can't just go around the circle again. Not necessarily doing decommissioning, just extending the life. Taking out the bits which are old and inefficient and putting in new assets, which are. So as we look forwards into future life cycles of the oil and gas industry, what we have as some small wind farm, you know, with one or two megawatt turbines today might be something different in 25 years' time. And if you're doing it um, responsibly and you're planning this change and this life extension, you don't have to do it all at once. I've got one wind, my wind farm here, it's got nine windmills in. Okay, in year number 25, I may replace three of them with two bigger ones. And then year 26 or 27, I'll do a couple more. Then the year after that, I'll do a couple more. And I've still got an asset. Now, you're still going to have to agree a new uh, lease term with the Crown Estate and get permission from Bayes and everything else. But the wind farms that we lay down today may be the same wind farms that are there in 100 years' time. Think about that. They may look a bit different in 25 years' time, 
They may be using some different materials that we haven't thought of. They may be much, much bigger. They may be combined with tidal generation or wave generation as well. But potentially, what we are building now will still be there, generating electricity in a hundred years time. Thank you very much. Uh, any questions, please? Uh, yeah. Questions. Uh, hi, thank you very much. Uh, w what if it's fatigue lives on critical elements of your structure that mean it's not safe to... Well, I mean, uh, if you're talking about this little sketch that I just yeah. put up, I mean, I've rem in the sketch I removed the entire turbine. So you're taking out the base. But if you're going to have a bigger windmill, you're going to need a bigger foundation, a stronger foundation. Um, and you remove the bits which are unsafe and you replace them with components that, that are. In this particular case, I've removed the whole windmill and you're going to put in a, a newer, bigger one somewhere nearby. So you decommission and then rebuild in the you, same You decommission you know, those three in one year and you replace them as you go. You don't have to do the, all 25 windmills in one wind farm in the same year. I mean, when you remove a pile, you destroy the seat, the soil around that pile. So you can't put the same one exactly on top of the old one. But you can do it 10 meters away or whatever. Um, you'd have to ask a soil expert, but you know, maybe 20 meters away, 10 meters, whatever. Apart from that, it wouldn't be any different. Uh, thanks for the interesting <coughs> presentation. Uh, I just wonder, um, uh, is any thought of using uh, all the platforms for wind farms, with all the wind uh, farms? Um, there have been. Um, there are a couple of studies going on around the UK at the moment. Um, there have been a couple of studies, particularly to use them for um, for the electrical station element. Um, the problem is that they're often not in the right place. Um, they're, they're too far out, out offshore. And they're often too old to bother to, to use. They're now suffering from fatigue. They're full of asbestos. Um, and they're not necessarily safe to be using. Um, the oil and gas industry would love somebody to use an old platform for, for wind. It just never really seems to work out on a cost basis. It's easier to make a smaller new one than it is to, to reuse an old one. Yeah, because I was thinking in, in an old platform you can install uh, three or four at least uh, uh, wind mills. I mean, we. There have been some studies to maybe put two on, because, but oil platforms aren't that big, because you can't have two right next to each other, the blades will interfere. Um, so it doesn't really work that well. Yeah, because they have the height, they have, uh, okay, they have also, I mean, it's uh, uh, 50, this, 50 meters, at least I think. Uh, some, of this, some of this also yeah. comes down to, um, to liability, in that if you are an oil and gas operator, you have a liability for that platform. And from your risk picture, you would prefer just to get rid of it, because then you don't need all the maintenance and the insurance, and um, you've got this liability on your balance books where you're holding several hundred million pounds to decommission this platform one day. And this sum of money has to sit in a bank account waiting one all the time. And that's a big risk, it's a big liability for an oil and gas operator. It is much better to take that platform out, get that liability off your books, and then build a new structure which you know you can decommission easily. 
uh, rather than keeping that old one around. But it, it, hasn't, it hasn't been done through lack of trying. Um, there have been many, many attempts to find ways to do this, and they're still ongoing. Yes, yeah, so Ken, thanks for your presentation, Ken. Can I, can I ask a question on a topic that you covered kind of toward the, the start of your... Yeah. Um, so you were talking about, um, you mentioned inflation. So we've got an asset in the English Channel, actually, that we're probably going to have to um, decommission the top sides first, and then just for affordability, come back in five, ten years in the future to, to address the base. Is there a, what, what index, what inflation mechanism do you use in, is there a specific inflation mechanism for the offshore industry? Or do you just use tender price index, for example? Do you, do you know? I, I just use Bank of England interest rates for these okay. for these figures. Yeah. Um, these, these are these are these are figures which are um, coming out in reports to say we spent X amount of money in 2010, and that was in 2010 money, and when I I'm, producing those graphs and things, in 2018 money or 2019 money, it's just the interest from those. But um, as an operator, this comes back to your liability, as I said. And if you are holding a sum of money in some sort of bond, then that's preventing you from getting loans for doing new projects that you'd like to do. So it may be costing you more than you think, because you can't take, take out those loans for new projects, and you can't um, be spending new, that money on things you'd like to do. And you're still maintaining it, and keeping it lit, and, keep, and expecting it all the time. Um, and there's the risk of, um, and there's the risk of increased vessel prices, and increased prices for people and increased other prices or decreased steel recycling prices. So um, the, so the historical figures that I've used are very, very simple, but as an operator, you have a lot more to think about and a lot more liabilities to consider. Sure. Uh, so I understand uh, that uh, the commission for wind farms have already started. Yes. Because it's a quite it's fairly new technology. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. there are some small wind farms. We're talking about um, five, eight, maybe ten turbines, which have been some of the small experimental wind farms which were built in the early 2000s and so on, um, which are now just out of date. You know, they were a quarter of a megawatt or something like that, and they worked well in their day. But now they're just not as efficient, um, and the money can be better spent elsewhere. Yeah. So uh, they have been successfully removed using you know, relatively small cranes and with relatively small blades to to get rid of. And also the the foundations from the bay. yeah. I mean, there were a couple which were made of concrete, which have proved more difficult. But the the modern structures are all steel piles. This problem will will hopefully go away a bit if we are moving to more uh, turbines which are further offshore and which are floating, because you can just take the moorings up, take the anchors up, and float them back into port potentially. So that will be different, and you won't be leaving anything on the seabed, but you are still going to have to recycle the, the tower and the nacelle and the blades as well. Yeah. Uh, yeah, um, thanks for your presentation. I think it's a very good presentation. Uh, so you mentioned um, you can decommission um, the wind turbines, not all at one time, but rather you can just fit. Uh, There's no few reason why you couldn't. No. But is it economical to do to do it that way? Because I think uh, if you are an oil and gas operator, all you want to do is want to get rid of everything at, in one go. So how is it economical to... If, if I'm a wind operator, and I have, let's use easy numbers, I have a hundred windmills. Okay? I'm getting revenue from those windmills every year. 
and I don't want to get rid of all of my revenue at one time. I'd be quite happy to get rid of 10% of my revenue, 10% of my windmills in year one, and replace them with bigger ones, and then get rid of 10%, another 10% in the following year. So you can keep your same maintenance teams, you can keep the same um, systems, you can keep many of the same electrical cables, perhaps just reroute them. So you're not disrupting your energy production and your income as well. The other thing is that um, if you're just doing a few per year, you're looking at a smaller working weather window. So let's say each windmill takes two days to remove with a jack-up. So if you're just doing 10, you only need 20 days. And you can find 20 days in the year quite easily. If you're trying to do 100 in the same year, you need 200 days with really good weather. And you're not going to find that in one year. So you spread it out. So there are, there are many, many reasons, you know, economic reasons and operational reasons why you don't want to do them all at the same time. Yeah. There are a few questions and comments from online. Okay. Shall I read them? Okay, the first one. How much knowledge exists about how removing these structures affect the underwater ecosystem? It has developed in the structure's lifetime. Um, so if anybody um, works in the offshore oil and gas industry and, and has looked um, subsea at the big jackets that we use, the big steel structures, um, you'll find that um, as soon as you go close to one of these structures, that's where all the sea life is. These structures are covered in, in seaweed and marine growth and starfish and um, shellfish and other things like that, covered in mussels. Um, and that's also where a lot of the fish live. Now, um, I haven't seen any um, studies on the environmental impact specifically of removing wind farms. But the, the surface area of the turbine bases underwater is not huge. Um, and I wouldn't expect the impact to be particularly bad. Um, but just like removing oil and gas assets, it is, um, it is a necessary evil, if you will, because when we are finished with any work that we do on the seabed today, we have a responsibility to restore the seabed to how it was before we got here as humans. So, to remove whatever we put in, essentially. Um, but I haven't seen any specific uh, studies for wind farms at this time. Thanks, Chris. The next one. If you've got one, send it to me. Email's yeah. on the presentation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, are there pollution concerns with leaving the structures in the environment? Um, I, mean, I, I refer you to my previous answer to that one, to be honest. Um, we have, we have a, a, an environmental responsibility and also a legal responsibility that any structures that we put on the seabed today have to be removed when we are finished. When we are finished, if you're still using the wind farm, and you're still using the turbines, then I don't see why you couldn't keep them there for as long as possible. Because you don't want to be pulling these turbines out every other year, because you're just causing more and more disruption to the marine environment. So, um, as long as you're still using it, and the environment is stable, that's the best thing, is to keep it stable. But once you're finished, um, we have those responsibilities to remove them no matter what. And um, the IMRS and Society for Underwater Technology has a lot of really good articles on uh, decommissioning uh, topics relating to oil and gas on their website. If you want to check some of those out, uh, many of those will be relevant to, deep, for, to wind farms as well. Thanks, Chris. So similar, yeah, I think you answer. Uh uh, are offshore structures uh, legally required to be removed? Is this overruled by cost? 
Uh, legally, yes, they have to be removed. That was easy. Yeah. Is this overruled by cost? Well, mm, I showed a slide much, much, uh, much earlier about the oil and gas structures, some of which have not been removed. And um, I said that they haven't, these concrete structures haven't been removed because the technology doesn't currently exist. And that is because a lot of these old concrete structures, they were never designed to be removed at the time, but what, that was just not in the design process. And these concrete structures are now fatigued and cracked. And many of them were used to store, store um, petroleum or crude oil while they were in use. And the biggest risk is if you try to remove these structures, they will fall apart. And the environmental impact of these concrete structures falling apart and leaking oil into the sea is simply too great to risk doing it. There is continued work in this area on what we could do to safely remove them. Um, but the costs that I've seen are excessively prohibitive. Um, but the authorities that, um, that are involved are happy for them to be deferred for now. Okay, then there's a comment. Uh, please stop calling these structures windmills. Nothing is being built. Fair, Fair comment? That's <laughs> sure. All right. Okay, the next one. Uh, I was offshore at Frick a few years after the failed installation of DP1. It was uh, unpiled, but was still standing, as it did until its uh, recent until it's recently. Yeah. Yes, um, there was, um, when I showed the picture of Frigg, there was another jacket structure, uh, which was, uh, as the commenter said, it was it's failed to install correctly. And it sat there for the entire length of the field life without being removed. And it was removed along with all the other structures there, yes. That one was the easiest one to do, actually. <laughs> Okay, the next one. There is no uh, there is no a significant environmental impact, but these impacts are not negligible. So it quite important to quantify them to make an informal decision. Yeah, that's a yeah. Um, uh, yeah. More studies need to be done in this area. Absolutely. Um, there, you know, there are lots of these structures. And um, the worst part of this is that you know, these structures can disturb the environment when they are put in. Then what happens is the environment then recovers while they're there. It takes a few years, but it, life goes on, and seaweed grows on them, and, and mussels and marine life. But then, sadly, taking, that, taking them out again is just as disruptive at that time. Um, so I would like to see some more detailed studies be done uh, on this. Yeah. Yeah. That's all online. Any other questions? In the room. Yeah. Go ahead, please. Uh, it's about recycling that uh, blade. So is there anything you hear that they will be reusing the blade? Because so I'm just thinking what type of damage the blade will get through the yeah during the lifetime. Okay, this is a different material when you compare to the steel. And then whether it can be just reused unless that totally the design they want to change it. Well you know they're essentially molded pieces. Um, uh, and you if if the, if there are if there is damage to the surface of the blade, I am I am not a blade engineer, but I understand that you can patch up the blade and recoat it so it's nice and smooth again. And, and there are um, sort of programs to, to re-coat these blades with, with Teflon every so many years to make sure they're nice and smooth as they turn around. Um, but once you remove them, um, there's not a lot you can do with them. Think of them like 
They're a bit like bicycle frames. Okay, if you've, if you've seen, you know, see, seen people who've got these carbon fiber bike frames, super lightweight, okay? It's a great frame, and you can use it for a few years. When you finish with it, it's still a frame-shaped piece of carbon fiber. And there's not much you can do with it. You can maybe cut out the, the straight bits and find a use for them, but it's, the carbon fiber has been custom molded into that shape. And as we move forwards, the wind uh, farm turbine blades that we use are more likely to get bigger than smaller. So the ones that we remove now are not going to be in demand for future wind farms. We're going to want bigger ones and bigger ones. So um, there might be a demand for them onshore, maybe? Um, if, we, if we're developing more wind farms there. Um, I've seen some experiments about cutting them up and you know, essentially getting um, small bits, you know, maybe about the size of this desk, maybe sort of A3 size bits, which you can then flatten and use as table mats or something. But that's not an industry, that's a novelty. Um, there is no clear use for that carbon fiber uh, in the end, no. Not at present. Uh, just now you mentioned something about, uh, you mentioned uh, about your concern about uh, removing the substructures because the substructures over the years they, they become a home to the sea life, right? Mm -hmm. um, what's your view on uh, leaving them to be to become corals or the sea life. I I asked um, a marine biologist a question a little bit like this a number of years ago, and I said, uh, and I was talking about oil and gas at the time, and I said, why don't we just take all these jackets and, and pile them up and make them into reefs, and the fish can live there. And this is something they've done in the United States and the Gulf of Mexico, and I said. You know, the North Sea is completely overfished now. There's not nearly as many fish there that used to be. We could help the fish stocks regrow. And she said, Christopher, the amount of extra surface area you create and the amount of extra fish you get is basically nothing. It's a drop in the ocean. It wouldn't have any effective, uh, it wouldn't have any real effect on the number of fish. So, um, as it stands, we have an obligation in the, in the long term to remove whatever we're finished with using. Uh, and I think we should just stick with that policy, basically. Um, yeah. Is that Thanks, Chris. Any more? Okay. Okay, then, uh, no more questions online. Okay, that's it. So, thanks, Chris, for this very informative and enlightening presentation. And as a token of our appreciation, we'd like to hand over the certificate to you on behalf of the Institute. Thank you very much. Thank you.